All right, so we're ready to go. And I want to start with very best wishes for Christmas and for the holidays and for a new year for everyone. I, th I think next week I will try to do a reflection on the end of the year. Uh, this week I'm going to do just an, an ordinary lecture. We actually left off kind of midway through in the previous lecture, and I'm going to try to complete the uh, themes that we were talking about. And, and I'm hoping you remember that we were talking about what technology is doing to our relationship to knowledge, to our knowledge system, to our capacity to um, be able to rely on the knowledge that we receive via media and other sources. And, and, and this followed the previous week, a, a lecture on whether or not a post-Trump America might still be a post-truth democracy and the suggestion that the forces that are uh, making our relationship to knowledge and, and expertise trust in those who have spent a lot of time acquiring technical or spe specialized knowledge um, more fraught in the 21st century, more problematic. And so I'll, I'll jump right back into the subject matter. There's a lot to talk about, but I do want to conclude today by talking about positive proposals for reform. Some, some of them pretty straightforward, some of them pretty innovative. So last week, and I'm, I'm not going to rehash this in any detail, we talked about Sophia Rosenfeld's work on uh, truth and democracy and her concern. I, I shouldn't say concern. She's a historian. She is uh, giving us a framework that suggests that the different eras, there are different relationships between what you might call the expertise and knowledge regime and ordinary people. And that when circumstances in society change or when the nature of the relationship between common sense and expert knowledge shifts, sometimes you get a populist pushback in which Ordinary people say, as opposed to trusting in or deferring to or attempting to come up to speed with expert knowledge, specialized knowledge, we're just going to push back, reject all of that, and rely on what we think we know using our common sense. And, and, and some of that has to do with suspicion of whether or not the experts are serving some sort of particular interest or using their expertise to claim additional social advantages. Some of it has to do with the degree of tension between common sense and, and expert knowledge or the degree of inaccessibility of expert knowledge to ordinary people. And some of it is a bit more contingent disruption in the media system being the thing that I, I proposed we should be focusing on. And, and then we focused in particular on this, I think very important idea of a networked public sphere as being really a new technological revolution that we are very much in the middle of in the third decade of the 21st century. This has been going on for a little bit more than a decade now, and it is radically transforming the way in which information is transmitted in our public sphere, the way in which our social connections and networks are shaped, the very character of the social relations that we have with other people. It is profoundly and deeply, ultimately transforming human nature as such. And I think it's very hard to, to get an adequate perspective on a profound social transformation that you are in the midst of. But that is our situation. And I think we really do need to do our best to come to grips with it. The, the, the full magnitude, the uh, ramifications, the ultimate political, social, cultural implications may not be apparent for 50 or 100 years. But we have to do our best to understand the major tendencies of these developments and, and to try to cope with them 
or else we are going to be merely pushed in whatever direction our new technology uh, takes us. Uh, I suggested that in public spheres, there's, if you will, too much of a good thing, too much openness in the transmission of information and knowledge, and that we have moved very quickly, right, over the course of 20 years from having really too little choke points and gatekeepers, a commercially controlled public sphere into having too much of uh, drinking from the fire hose flooded with unreliable information and disinformation kind of public sphere. I then brought us into thinking about network theory in particular and the, the work of O'Connor and Weatherall, a couple of scientists in providing us rather simplified, but I think quite useful diagrams, heuristics for thinking about the properties of different kinds of networks and, and the way in which some networks isolate people and put them in touch with just a couple of other people. Some uh, networks are better at connecting people, but really connect them centrally to a single individual. Some networks connect everybody to everybody, and some networks basically isolate tribal social groups uh, in their own specific epistemic or knowledge ecosystems, right? And, and that um, what O'Connor and Weatherall suggested is that, and, and, and they are philosophers of science, that for scientific knowledge accumulation to work well, you need a network in which those who make an advance are connected to and able to persuade those who are still working within a now superseded paradigm, right? And, and so this kind of network has that kind of attribute, although two scientists make the initial breakthrough, eventually everybody converges on it with a high degree of confidence in that breakthrough. And on the other hand, there are forms of networks in which right, the uh, scientists in the network with the incorrect beliefs are protected from being exposed to the better beliefs by a couple of gatekeepers who are so sure that they're right that they don't bother to communicate to the rest of the network the idea that there's an alternative uh, competitor to their framework for analysis. So that's where we left off last week. And this week, I want to apply O'Connor and Weatherall's ideas to the actual structure of political communication in the United States. This will be information that I've spoken with you about before, but I want to move from here to other implications. Forgot this, we, we, we talked about propagandistic opinion manipulation also last week and, and how when it's not just the natural dynamics of, of a scientific community, but you have somebody who has money and power to try to shape the opinion of scientists in order to shape the opinion of policymakers, things can really go askew in which policy will not reflect the better insight of the more credible scientists, the scientists who are not in fact being funded by or beholden to the propagandist because the propagandist manages to influence some of the policymakers and enough of the scientists to give the policymakers who are perhaps funded by the propagandist some cover for continuing to do what the propagandist makes it uh, lucrative or advantageous for them to do. All right, so, so now shifting into um, the actual structure of the contemporary American public sphere, in particular, the networked public sphere, the online digital media public sphere. And I, I have spoken with you about 
uh, the work of Yeshai Bankler, who's up here, and his colleagues, Robert Ferris and Hal Roberts. And I think this extraordinarily important work, important because of the nature of the empirical information it gathers and collects, and then the analytic frameworks that it proposes to make sense of this information. This is a, a, a diagram. And, and I know it's a little uh, perplexing at first sight of um, network connections among media websites covering political issues in 2016. And the diagram is organized um, in a political spectrum, the left is the left, the right is the right, politically speaking, and the size of the dots in this galaxy of potential media sites, it reflects the amount of traffic that different sites get, that is to say, the degree to which people are paying attention to those sites. So, so the biggest dots here, the Washington Post, the New York Times, um, CNN, the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, Breitbart, those are the big dots and the little dots are, are outliers, less prominent media outlets. And then the, the lines, which, which you kind of see as a haze in this diagram. And, and, and by the way, one of the reasons this research is so impressive to me is that they are literally mapping millions I'm sorry, billions of connections between different websites or, or, or referrals, the, the number of links, the number of times people move from one site to another. And uh, the, the blue lines indicate uh, interconnection between left or center media eco outlets, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, media outlets, and the red lines represent interconnections between right-wing media outlets. And if they are crossing between the left and the right, they're, they're more purple. But what you can see is dense interconnection on the left and center left, dense interconnection on the right, and little connection between the left and the right, especially little referring um, from the right wing media ecosystem to the center and left wing media ecosystem in the United States. We, we can blow this up a little bit and that allows you to see a little bit better the way in which you could almost draw a line, right? And, and so although it's not as neat as a, a diagram, what we have in the American media ecosystem is something approximating this kind of cliquish or clumpy network of communication between media sites in which the left and the center is more or less its own system. It does refer to the right, but it's not got a lot of communication with the right. And, and the right is tightly interconnected among its large uh, outlets, but does very little referring to. There's very little communication between the right and the left from the right. And, and this is especially problematic as far as uh, Bancor Roberts are concerned because it is the case that there are actually different business models and therefore ultimately different information and knowledge production models in these two different wings of the media system. This is what the dominant model is in the left and the center, and it is uh, called by them a reality check dynamic. The most important dynamic in these diagrams is the dynamic within the media. And here, the media are competing on truth quality, but also on 
the scoop or the ability to be the first, especially to get uh, a sensational or important story. And sometimes that misleads them, leads them to rush into something that they haven't adequately verified. But when that happens, they end up then being punished by their competitors because each of these media outlets is policing the others to make sure that what they report is true or at least verifiable. And this then helps to mute some of the normal tendencies within the overall dynamics of the public sphere in which the members of the public want two things from their media system. They want identity confirming news. And, and I'll just point out to you for a moment, right? You have multiple options on your dial in terms of your news feed. Do you go to the station or the outlet that tends to systematically disagree with you? Right. And, and, and I think the answer for the vast majority of us is no, absolutely not. So, so, so we do want to learn things that confirm what we already believe, that sit easily with our pre existing worldview, that make us believe that we are in the right and therefore that we are good and decent people. Right. But Presumably, we also want the truth. Um, at least, let us hope that most of us want to believe uh, that what we're receiving from our news media, from our journalists, from the people whose business is fact gathering, information confirming, facilitating the discourse on which democracy relies, we don't just want to be told you're a good person and everything you believe is right. We also want to know new information, and in particular, if we're confused and wrong about something, to be corrected about, it, right? And, and so uh, an example here, I think many environmentalists in the 1980s, 1990s, maybe the first decade of the 21st century were anti-nuclear, right? And, and for good reasons, right? How in the world do we dispose of that waste in a responsible way that makes us secure that there won't be an eventual disaster, right? And, and, and so um, that's an understandable position, but as the uh, shift in environmental concerns to global climate change and warming became more prevalent and decisive as, as, as more and more people came to the realization, wait, there is a single most urgent issue that we have to give priority to if we care about maintaining the Earth's ecosystems and that is climate change. And by the way, despite the problems with nuclear energy, it is not contributing greenhouse gases to the environment. And we may need to rely on it for the next 20, 30, 40 years while we're waiting for fusion or solar or wind or battery technology to be able to meet all of our energy needs. And, and so we get our view corrected by a reporting, by a new information, by a, the presentation of new perspectives and new arguments. And if what we want is not only to confirm what we already believe, but also to have bad beliefs corrected, then we change our minds, right? And, and, and so the fact that this media system prioritizes the reliability and verifiability, the truth of the knowledge that it presents moderates the identity confirming desire and demands of its viewers. Similarly, politicians, of course, want favorable coverage. And so they're really trying, they have whole PR and media operations to, to try to make sure they get coverage, but the, the media, if they're truth confirming, 
only will want to report favorably on a politician when there is a good reason to report favorably on the politician. And that will actually modify what politicians do as well. And, and so this is then a media system that is relatively healthy for a democracy. And this is the kind of media system that um, the United States had, many Western developed democracies had in the middle of the 20th century through the late 20th century, um, in part because of the journalistic ethics of those who were in leadership positions within the media system. This is the alternative system. And, and, and this is the one that um, Bancor, Ferris and Roberts believe is really new um, and, and uh, requires digital media in order to take hold. And in a digital media system, two things change. The, the, the first is a, as opposed to a few outlets which engage in news coverage a few hours a day. You have multiple outlets, some of which are 24 seven news and it allows for much more segmentation. The conservatives have their channel, the moderates have their channels, the liberals have their channels, right? And, and, and so we can self segregate our media diets and in particular, we, I think it needs to be called really the Fox News model. This is where it starts and, and this is where it's still most influential. Um, the media police themselves almost exclusively for identity confirmation. This is what they compete to do. And when Fox News says Trump lost Arizona, Breitbart and Daily Callers and, and other outlets savage them. And the result is that very quickly Fox starts bringing out more prominently election deniers to regain their audience share, right? And so the identity confirmation model is uh, a self-policing model, but it's a self-policing model not on the issue of the verifiability of the information, but instead simply on identity confirmation. And this leads then to a viewership, a, a segment of the public that primarily seeks and receives identity confirmation, especially when the media ecosystem they participate in gives them a healthy diet of it and tells them that those other outlets are biased and not credible. And so in fact, they are getting the truth and it does confirm their identities. And then the politicians who are seeking favorable news coverage can get it just by saying the things that are in conformity with the expectations of the media system and the public. It doesn't matter anymore whether they're true or verifiable because the media system is not operating with that norm or that demand. And you end up with, as you can see, a self-supporting dynamic here in which all of the major actors in this system are aligned on the primacy of confirming their pre-existing beliefs and biases, even when those do not conform to factual knowledge information, what is verifiable. And, and so what we have seen in the American media system then is not only a segregation of left from right, but two different models of information and knowledge production, one of which is reasonably fact-based, but one of which is not. And the sense that we have two different and competing realities in the United States is then I think extremely important and not just a uh, everyday observation, but rooted in the structure and the transformation of our media system. And, and so when we investigate where fake news comes from, I think an important thing to see is the dominance of social media 
in the production of fake news. And there, there's one other aspect of this that I should add, and that is that what uh, we get uh, in the, the, the work of, of Bancor, Ferris and Roberts is, is in a sense not fully present in this diagram. We, we have to look at this diagram. The sense that there are far right small outlets that generate disinformation, right? The Pizzagate scandal, the idea that the election was stolen, the QAnon theory, have to be careful, actually, the idea that the election was stolen emanated from the White House, from, from the President of the United States, as we're seeing with the January 6th Congressional Special Investigative Committee's report. The, clearly, that did not come from the fringes of the media system. But Pizzagate, QAnon do come from the fringes of the media system, but they get amplified by the major outlets. And so this is what they call a propaganda feedback loop. And, and so the information, the fake news originates on social media that wasn't present in the 20th century, right? This is a product of the transformation of our public sphere, the coming online of digital media. And, and we can see um, that, that um, the public's appetite in the left and the center is for relatively moderate news in terms of its political slant. It, 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 the, the most attention goes to the most moderate news sites, but on the right, the uh, appetite is for the most ideologically extreme news. Um, and that the majority of fake news, if we're looking at now the, the mainstream uh, broadcast media comes from Fox News. I know I've shared this with you before, followed by MSNBC, which is uh, on the left, the closest to the Fox News model, CNN much more reliable. And then when we look at not just which outlet, but which particular individuals on these outlets are disseminating bad information in not only Fox, where it's either paid conservatives or unpaid conservatives who dominate the network and so are the primary sources of bad information on the net network, but also on CNN, also on ABC. It is primarily the conservatives that they bring on for the sake of balance who in fact disseminate bad information. So now with all of that, and, and I know that's that's kind of review, I, I want to now focus on what this does to not only our knowledge system, but our very process of knowledge acquisition. And, and if you remember last summer and fall, I was put together a series on deranged democracy and, and the idea that, that we had learned a fair bit about the way in which the human mind operates that meant that the ideas of the enlightenment in which our 18th century democratic constitution is very much founded have been rendered somewhat problematic by more recent advances in, in psychology, cognitive science, and philosophy. And I'll, I'll just very briefly point out that, that this man, Andy Clark, who was one of the leading philosophers of mind uh, living in the world today, um, suggests that um, the human mind, as he puts it quite provocatively, is not exclusively related, I'm, I'm sorry, situated, uh, located in your brain or even your body. It is in fact very much also contained in your environment. And that includes your technological environment so that as our public sphere has become networked as the models of 
the way in which information is produced and transmitted have been transformed, the very way in which we think, the very way in which we acquire knowledge have been, has been transformed as well. Uh, Joseph Heath, a contemporary Canadian philosopher, also very influential in his book, Enlightenment 2.0, builds on Clark's work, but suggests in particular that as we've come to understand more about typical cognitive biases or heuristics, the way in which the mind works and the way in which it often relies on unconscious shortcuts to generate its knowledge, we have come to be better at manipulating the way in which people think and make up their minds and that industries like the technology industry are very much taking advantage of these new insights, these new breakthroughs. And therefore um, the environment of the extended mind, the, the environment of our intellectual technology is increasingly hostile to calm deliberation, to autonomy to thinking for ourselves. And I, I just want to delve a little bit further into this idea to lay the groundwork for our need for regulation in the, in the 21st century. Um, and so I'll, I'll introduce a new book, a new thinker, uh, I, at least I haven't spoken with you about her before, uh, Marianne Wolf, who just this year published this book, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. And, and Marianne Wolf is a uh, doctor who specializes um, in the way in which learning occurs. Um, and uh, she also has a background in literature. She teaches at UCLA. She's very uh, involved in what's sometimes called the shallowing hypothesis, the idea that our relationship to knowledge is becoming more and more shallow as the amount of information available to us has grown and as our uh, way of acquiring knowledge has shifted from print media to screens. And, and so this book, and, and, and she uh, wrote an earlier book, Proust and the Squid, some of you may have encountered around a decade ago, it was a bestseller, Reader Come Home, A Reading Brain in a Digital World, makes the case for the idea that the way in which we acquire knowledge fundamentally shapes our ways of thinking in relationship to knowledge. And that as younger and younger children spend more and more time on digital media and screens in general, it is changing the way they think. Um, and so um, the, the importance of the process of knowledge acquisition, the idea, and, and, and here I think this is just fascinating stuff, that when human beings become literate, when they acquire the capacity to read, the very structure of the brain changes. The areas in the brain that develop dense neural networks and interconnections shifts into the frontal cortex. And, and, and so the background to this in, in cognitive science is that learning to read Wolf reports is one of the few things that we do that there is no um, hard wiring for in the brain, no evolved uh, method of learning that skill. As opposed to that, we're using multiple areas of the brain that have evolved for other purposes and repurposing them in order to be able to read. And it turns out, especially once you've acquired this ability and you're reading a demanding book, especially a work of fiction that involves your imagination in addition to your cognitive and intellectual capacities, that the brain lights up, that there's a coordination across almost all the regions of the brain 
that isn't there in almost any other human activity. Perhaps transcendental meditation sometimes acquires the same degree of hemispheric and network integration in the brain, but this is a fairly unique activity and we are doing less and less of it. And, and, and so in, in the past, I've spoken with you about Sherry Turkle's work and the idea that human beings based on our uh, monitoring of our own activities are spending less and less time in conversation and less and less time reading and especially less time reading books. And, and so when we read on a device like my phone or a device like the computers we're communicating with each other on right now, um, Wolf points out that the brain operates differently. We, we don't go into the kind of deep concentration that reading a book evokes or reading a newspaper for that matter, if it's a physical newspaper can evoke, that we also don't monitor ourselves as well to determine whether or not we are actually successfully understanding the information, the perspectives, the knowledge that is being conveyed by the media, the book or the screen, we do monitor when we read the book. And, and one of the things she points out is that most people who read books go frontwards, but also backwards. They, they, they notice when they haven't got an idea or there's something from a previous page they need to think about a little bit more and they flip back on a screen, almost nobody does that, right? And, and so, the claim here is that we're witnessing a transition between two modes of thinking as our media changes and that some of the stuff that happened in the not too distant past, the last 200, 300 years as uh, the printed book and the printed newspaper became more affordable, literacy spread, the uh, authors of books got to assume a larger audience and a private reader reading in the quiet of their own study or perhaps just their own living room, that the, the whole birth of an experimental creative form of writing, the novel, new forms of poetry, the essay, that this is all product of this new way of writing and reading that grew up in dialogue or dialectic with each other, and that we really may be losing deep aspects of enlightenment and modern culture as we change the way we read. And, and so that's just to, to get at some of the deeper implications here, again, to review very quickly part of, of what we're coping with is a rapidly accelerating rate of technological innovation and the spread of new technology. When we look at these older technologies, whether it's radio or automobiles or television, right? It, it, it took 50, to 100 years for these technologies to take hold and become ubiquitous. When we look at the more recent technology, especially the digital technology, they go from non-existent to ubiquitous in five years to a decade, right? And, and this gives us very little time to adapt to this technology, in particular, to develop the cultural resources with which to regulate our use of this technology as we come to understand what it is doing to us. And, and so you can see in particular, if we drill down on the last 20 years and the spread of digital media and in particular social media, that they have taken off from having no users to having billions of users in a very short period of time. 
that in particular, the younger people, and, and this diagram focuses us on the people who are 18 to 24 and 25 to 30 years old, where 90 plus percent of the people are using this technology, right? It has become all but obligatory to be engaged with these new media outlets. And in particular, the number of teenagers, right? And, and, and this is a formative period, cognitively speaking, who are using this technology more than once a day, almost constantly or hourly. This is rapidly changing the whole process of cognitive, emotional, psychological development for kids. And, and we are basically just leaving it to parents to navigate, to try to figure out what in the world can we do about this? And, and, and my suggestion, this is very brief based on, on other stuff I've, I've spoken with you about, is, is that it's not just now that there's a whole media ecosystem that is broadcasting BS and a whole bunch of us that are believing it, in a deeper sense, our very capacity to pay attention, to autonomously direct our own thought processes is being eroded by our technology. And, and, and so it's not just preserving our democracy and in a sense, it is preserving our autonomy that requires that we be more self-conscious in the regulation of this technology. And again, this is review and I'm going through it quickly, I know, but I think we've, we've had these conversations before. The, the te technology is changing our affect, our emotion as well. It is in terms of what it exposes us to, how it generates its content, structured by algorithms. And these algorithms are designed with primarily one purpose in mind, and that is maximizing the amount of time we spend engaged with a particular social media platform, keeping our eyes on the screen because that's what maximizes their revenues. And what they've discovered is that one of the best ways to do this is via amplifying our affect, making us angry or frightened angry, I'm sorry, anxious or outraged. And, and, and that this um, then actually changes us emotionally, especially when we're being exposed to this from a very early age. So final thing to, to talk about for a moment here, the business model and the way in which the business model really relies on manipulating your attention. And I've, I've spoken with you before about Tim Wu, who now is uh, official in the Biden administration working on antitrust, formerly a professor of law at Columbia University. And I, I absolutely love his book, The Attention Merchants, and Shoshana Zuboff, a emeritus professor at Harvard Business School, who uh, wrote The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, I think a, a very, uh, illuminating study of the Google business model. And what they point out is that um, central concepts like privacy are being transformed by the way in which this technology operates and by the way in which it encourages us to disclose more and more about ourselves and post it to social media, that the thingness of things uh, is also being changed, that, that as we get more and more used to speaking to Alexa and telling her to play music or speaking to our phones and telling them who to call or our washing machine telling us when we need to get new detergent, we, we're interacting less in a direct face-to-face -face way with other human beings and more and more with our technology. Finally, 
um, the suggestion of Zuboff, which is, is that we have these very powerful machine learning or artificial intelligence driven technologies that are figuring out how to control us, how to manipulate us in order to get more and more information about our behavior in order to manipulate us still more, right? That in a sense, this is the Google business model uh, and that the uh, idea that we are perhaps increasingly surrendering our autonomy to technology that surveils and then manipulates us is I think another aspect of this that really should be setting off alarm bells for those who can, are concerned about public policy. Finally, right, and, and, and again, just yet another aspect of, of this, the way in which algorithms are reproducing and, and artificial intelligence and machine learning reproducing forms of social hierarchy, uh, ways in which they're being used to monitor and surveil the poor, ways in which they reproduce the racism of their users. And, and I won't go into a great deal of detail on this today, but this is just another reason that we need to be thinking about how to regulate this technology, that the algorithm is a black box, as Frank Pasquale, a, a law professor, puts it, that the, the, it's proprietary. And so we just don't know um, way, the, the, the way it's structured and how it works. But what we do see is uh, a lot of empirical evidence that the social media technology, the way the algorithms and the machine learning work, um, is reinforcing both bias and hierarchy, that there's an awful lot of both implicit and explicit racism um, in social media, and that there's an awful lot of algorithmic decision-making in areas of public policy, things like insurance markets and their eligibility decisions, hiring and firing decisions that um, end up privileging the already privileged and disadvantaging the already disadvantaged. Again, another place where we should be thinking about regulation. So let's start talking about regulation. Um, and I will uh, try to unpack this for you very quickly. Here I'm drawing on, on a recent article by Joshua Cohen and Arkong Foon Cohen at UC Berkeley and Apple University Foon at Harvard. And, and, and among our best and most interesting theorists of democracy these days. And, and what they do is, is, and I think it's important to see that they look at the rights and opportunities for communication in the public sphere that a democracy relies on. And they point out, look, this is ambiguous. The transformation from 20th century mass media to 21st century digital media technology in the kind of public sphere that it generates, in fact, has improved our capacity to express ourselves. The access that we have to information and to networks of communication, the diversity of perspectives present and our capacity to use our ability to communicate to form politically powerful networks. So that in certain respects, and, and one way to think about this is when we think about Black Lives Matter, when we think about hashtag me too the the movement uh, narrowly to make people accountable men accountable for sexual harassment in hollywood but more broadly to try to rein in the epidemic of sexual harassment and sex-based discrimination in american society when we think about the Sunrise Movement, the, the young people's um, movement for 
climate justice, or when we think about uh, Third Act, which I know many of you are active in, um, that, that these movements would not have been possible without the new affordances or capacities that social media allow us to tap. So, so important democratic advantages, but also important disadvantages with regards to the truth, with regards to our ability to coalesce around a shared understanding of the common good and with regards to civility. And so they suggest a number of reforms that would be uh, uh, better in keeping with these central democratic values. And I wanna spend just a, a minute on, on some of these reforms. So to begin with taxing social media platforms based on how they generate their revenue, not just their overall profitability, because some of what they do that is most, uh, on the one hand, ultimately profitable, but on the other hand, also problematic, does not show up directly on their balance sheet. So, so taxing data collection, right? Every time we use Google, unless we get our privacy settings exactly right, they are collecting data on us that ultimately generates their profit. If we want to discourage that, or at least to make the social cost of constant surveillance part of their business calculus, we could tax the data collection itself. Similarly, tax digital advertising um, and use that tax revenue to support informative and reliable digital journalism. I, I wanna show you this diagram from Robert McChesney's Digital Disconnected, another book on digital media and democracy. And he does something I think that, that that's very interesting and important. He shows the correlation between the press freedom score uh, collected by Freedom House or Reporters Without Borders, the democracy index of the country uh, using the Economist Democracy Index and funding for public media. And as you can see, there's a pretty clear and strong correlation. Strong press, free press correlated with the health of the overall democracy of the society. Strong free press democracy correlated with the amount per capita spent on public media. And you can see, right? Norway spends $130 per person per year on public media. Denmark, United Kingdom, Finland, spending 90 to 100 to $110 per person per year to support their public media. The United States spends about a buck 50 per year. And so we could be doing a lot better. And in particular, as so much of our media, our news system, our knowledge production system migrates online, funding, publicly subsidizing good digital media, good social media content could transform the actual content of even the commercial sites. And that's, I think, one of the things that's really important to see in this diagram. What McChesney and others who study this find is take the BBC as, as an example. And, and right, the BBC is not as well-funded per capita as some of the Scandinavian public media outlets are, but it's well enough funded that it sets the bar for other media outlets in Britain. Everybody watches the BBC, and so everybody is aware of what good non-commercial public media looks like, and the commercial media have to compete with that, and that improves the system as a whole. We certainly could be doing better, and so we could be taxing what we see 
as destructive or pernicious or problematic forms of revenue generation in the new media ecosystem to support things that would improve that ecosystem. Um, mandating, and I put that in parentheses because I, I think there's some question in, in, in the scholarship on this. Should this be a uh, new federal law that requires that algorithms and platform uh, reform how they convey news in order to promote credible sources and diversity so that people are not simply seeing things always that they already believe and that would strengthen and broaden the news diet of people who are consuming social media as their primary news outlet, should that be mandated or should that merely be encouraged? I, there is ambiguity about that because there's also concern about freedom of the press, recognizing that social media are press outlets. Um, third idea, revive antitrust regulations. And, and, and I wanna be as clear as possible, important stuff is happening with the Biden administration. I think there is an appetite for this in the people who Biden has appointed in antitrust and media regulation will have to see if they're actually able to do some of this, but, but revive antitrust regulation to break up the extraordinary gatekeeping powers of big tech. And, and if we ever needed further reminding of this, we can look at what Elon Musk has done in the month that he's been in control of Twitter in terms of, right, kicking journalists who report critically on him off, re-inviting Trump on, um, and uh, removing much of the safety uh, or monitoring teams so that all of a sudden the amount of disinformation goes up radically. Um, and he can do it because he threw down 40 plus billion dollars to buy a large portion of the media system, at least the digital media system that so many people rely on. Strengthen privacy and security data protection rules. This is just so straightforward, right? Our, our privacy and data security rules are mainly 20 to 50 years old. They are for uh, completely different technological moment. We now live in a world where data collection has completely evolved. We need to evolve our regulations to keep up with the world we live in. And then again, in parentheses, self-regulate or regulate in the way that we tend to regulate through government platforms for noxious speech. And, and there's a legal definition here, reckless and negligent misrepresentation of facts, especially about persons, hate speech, bullying, and disinformation. And the question mark is, can you do this without stifling free speech? Do you end up getting swept into the idea of noxious speech or disinformation, dissident perspectives that are in fact ultimately credible, though not currently popular. And again, I, I, I do think we have to weigh not only the values of getting truth reliably present in our media system, but also allowing for diversity, freedom, and recognizing that this is the new form of public sphere. I wanna share one last idea with you today. I know I'm running short on time, but just to, to, to in a sense, uh, flip the, the uh, onus here, and, and that is to talk about the idea that 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when, when, when all this technology was first coming online, the, the people who were thinking about its political implications were frankly wide-eyed utopians, right? And, and, and um, 
most of them have become bitterly disappointed in what was actually done with this technology that they thought might democratize the public sphere. But I do think their ways of thinking through the use of this technology, that if it is appropriately regulated, funded, and if we are more innovative in thinking about how to employ it, and if we are also willing to change the way in which we make law, the way in which we search for proposals for reform, perhaps even the way in which we structure elections, this technology might be able to really allow us to do democracy differently and maybe even better to repair some of its current faults. I'm not going to go into a whole set of ideas, but I, I would just point out, and this is kind of a spectrum of more and less utopian or transformative or radical ideas, that there are a whole bunch of scholars out there thinking about how to creatively use this technology to take advantage of its new abilities to help us improve democracy. We have to be willing to control its use to do that. And that's why I emphasize reform. But if we are willing to do the hard work of determining how to reform, how to regulate, how to control our technology, there's a, a possible world in which we use that technology to actually deeply repair and restructure democracy. How's that for a provocative way to, to conclude? Let's uh, start with discussion. Who, well, Flossie told us there's not a lot going on there today. Who, who wants to start the conversation? I so go ahead, David. Yeah, it, well, just unmute yourself. You you don't need to raise I, your hand. I think I did. I, I can you okay. hear me? I think I, yes. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that um, the uh, fundamental moral issues of what's good, um, ethical issues of what's right, and epistemological issues of what counts as uh, as knowledge uh, uh, haven't changed. But what technology has done is it's unleashed this powerful tool that intensifies, extends, accelerates uh, the, uh, the whatever, whatever we used to be able to do on the moral, ethical, and epistemological front. And just, and the big danger, of course, is that we'll build a system uh, as we saw in 2000, what was the, the um, movie with Hal, was that 2000? 2001? Yeah, where uh, it, it takes over and makes those moral, ethical, and epistemological issue, uh, decisions for itself. And that what the safe, I was looking at the safeguards you suggested at the end, and they all strike me as um, ways of uh, preventing the system from um, overtaking uh, those, those fundamental issues uh, on its own. And making those decisions in, um, um, in a way that allows us as both individuals and as a collective democracy from making those decisions for ourselves. So it seems to me that that the, uh, that the op that, uh, technology pre prevent presents an opportunity for both greater malevolence, but also greater virtue. And, uh, and it's up to us to maintain control over those three domains. At least there are probably others too that I'm leaving out, but at least those three. Thank so, you, David. And, and, I'm, and, not, I, I'm, I'm willing to take on that challenge because it offers so many other affordances in terms of making um, lots of opportunity and, um, and um, even uh, power available to a greater number of people. Yeah, so, so on your last comment, let me point out an idea from Marianne Wolf, who, who, whose book, Reader Come Home, I, I'm reading right now and I really like. Um, she um, suggests that there's no way 
we're going to put the genie back in the bottle. And, and she's not alone in suggesting that. But in particular, that when it comes to reading on screens, that young people are just never going to stop doing this. And not only that, when we look at, for instance, Wikipedia, uh, another way to to put this, and, and I think this is a really nice way to, to express this idea, is that up until, let's say 20 years ago, um, knowledge and information were scarce, right? That's been the fundamental human condition. And the people who have the knowledge and the information tend to also have a lot of power, right? And that one of the wonderful things that this new technology has done and potentially can do even better is to democratize access to knowledge. And to get that access, we need to read on screens, right? And, and on the other hand, she encourages what she calls, and it, it's an interesting neologism, by literalism, right? So, so, so that, that we teach children to read books and screens and to recognize the different ways they engage with materials when they read in print as opposed to digital media, and then to be able to recognize when what they're reading requires one modality or another, right? And, and to shift, to, to maybe just print out or to get the book from the library when they're actually in need of the form of deeper engagement that, that you get with print media than with digital media. I can see you want to respond. I was just getting started, but go ahead. You got it. Well, yeah. I, I just wanted to say vis-a-vis -vis the reading online versus in print, uh, uh, you're right. We, we can't go back. Um, and the, um, the downside of reading online uh, that she points out in her book and what it does to the brain and the like, uh, there's another side to that, and that is the affordances of reading online. Uh, when you read online and you see a word you don't know, you can look it up immediately. You don't have to wait until a week from, you know, the next time you go to the library or you don't have to walk into the next room to pull out the Funk and Weidels. Uh, uh, you also have the, uh, the opportunity for multimedia. It, reading is not just print on a page. Uh, reading in today's world is filled with a, a, a diverse array of representations and imaginal um, auditory and uh, visual stimuli come at us uh, uh, simultaneously. And that's a very different experience and one that really requires a new, defi new definition of reading. And, and psychologists have yet to tackle the inner workings of, of uh, we're barely getting to our understanding about how we process print and it's, uh, uh, it requires um, a, a whole new set of experiments that we haven't done yet to understand what it means to read and understand with these new media. But the point I wanted to make about it's not just the reading part, it's the production side. The, the internet is the ultimate democracy of the production of, uh, of information. And, and that, to me, more than anything else, uh, points to we have to double or triple or quadruple down on teaching kids uh, how to uh, be critical and and um, skeptical about information. Uh, the the book and the print uh, world we lived in had a lot of uh, governors, people who who told us what was good for us to read, and we never had to make those decisions. Now those decisions come down to individuals and groups, and we see this proliferation of information, most of which is schlock. And, and so what we need in our schools is schlock detectors like we never needed them before. Yeah, thank you. And, and there's a lot in what you say there. I, I'm going to circle back for a second. And, and, and I completely agree with you that, that it's not just reception, it's production. Wikipedia is a really good example. I'm going to give a quick example. I'm, I'm, I'm in Northern California. I'm assisting a low income relative whose uh, catalytic converter went kaput and he can't afford to get it repaired. And so I Googled to see what programs were available in California to assist low income people who have car problems. And boom, 
you know, there are actually 10 programs out there. And in a, you know, a matter of seconds, we had information on all 10 of them. Imagine the pre-digital universe trying to get that information. We probably would have taken days of going office to office or making lots of phone calls. There are wonderful things that this technology does. David raised how and 2001 A Space Odyssey. I just will point out, I did not even begin to touch on artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the new chat bot revolution that, that appears to be beginning to take hold as the next iteration of this incredibly accelerated technological change. Those are topics for another day. But part of my claim here is that this technology is changing so quickly and changes us as it changes that we really need to not just be ethical about it. I will use this, but I'll use it responsibly. Educate media literacy, absolutely shock detectors for our students. We need to regulate and, and we need to, I think, think about the idea that this stuff is engineered to be addictive in the same way that cigarettes were chemically engineered to be addictive. As a society, we eventually concluded that we couldn't just rely on people to make smart choices about cigarettes. We had to prevent children, for instance, from smoking and put aggressive health warnings. I think that that's a pretty good analogy for the limits of self-regulation with this new technology. John, it looks like you have a comment. Go ahead. Uh, two things. First, very in passing, I would note that I, I don't know how fast things are changing. I think the decade ago, things were changing really fast, but I don't know if there's been enormous differences in technology that affect our lives in the last six or eight years, but let that pass. I'm also wondering about the effect on reading because, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that the circulation of books, uh, print books, reasonably, you know, serious books, hasn't gone down particularly. It's been it's been quite healthy. It's books sell and people read them. And uh, I think also that the circulation of relatively serious magazines, London Review of Books, New York Review of Books, New Yorker, I think those circulations have held up pretty well too. Although of course, Life Magazine years ago and others have gone out of business. So it certainly has an impact, but it's a differential impact. And a lot of the people that we think about are really, you know, need to be reading. I think a lot of them I think a lot of them are reading. Whether yeah, so, on, I don't know whether on screen or in a print book, but I mean the overall circulation. I mean you have to include Kindle in that and all too. Yeah, and and um, one of the things that Marianne Wolf suggests is is you can, if you're very deliberate and intentional about it, read your Kindle in exactly the same way you read a book. But, but you, in a sense, you have to make up your mind that that's the way you're going to do it. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I, I haven't researched it about the circulation of, of, of books or the sale of books and the different kinds of books that are selling. Um, you know, the, the, there are double the number of human beings on the planet that there were 20 years ago. And so we have to be careful in thinking about uh, per capita as opposed to just sales figures. But the thing that I, I have gathered from the research I've been doing is that um, for these use of time surveys, which I, I, I think actually the institution you taught at, it was one of the places that, that leads in, in this field of research, uh, people report that they spend less time reading print media in the last decade than in previous decades, right? So they're spending more times on screen, less time with a physical book or newspaper or magazine. And, and so that's compatible with they're still buying the books, but they're not actually spending as much time with the books. But that's the, the, probably that's, mostly newspapers. Yeah, uh, it, it, I, I'm not sure about that, Trump. But yeah, I mean, that newspapers, no question, newspapers are down. I mean, all but yeah. the very best. Well, and and the local, I, I think you've seen the the, the data on um, 
the number of journalists employed in the United States. We're to like a 50 year low and local journalism is just quickly going all but extinct. But you know, local newspapers were killed by technology, but it wasn't the technology that people don't want to read them. The te technology that killed them was that classified advertising no longer works because that's been replaced by the internet and that, that was their main source of revenue, I think. So in a way, it's sort of a little bit tricky. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, that's funny yeah. for me. You know, you're absolutely right. Craigslist killed the want ad. Um, Marion, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I want to bring up an issue that has to do uh, with the population that we're living with right here at Piedmont Gardens. Uh, I think what happens is that um, with the print media that we used to use exclusively, we could own it, we could underline things, we could make it our own. When we forget something, which we're doing all the time, it's wonderful to pick up a book, uh, look at where we left a bookmark and uh, give us the main idea of that particular book. We can't seem to do that with the screen media. We're not good at uh, getting back to programs. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Uh, to uh, sort of reinforce an idea that we've forgotten. But for people with memory problems, that makes uh, you know, screen media very much more complicated than what we used to have. Thank you, Marian. And it's, I, I want to focus for a second. Everyone has a memory problem in the sense that if you're in an oral culture, right, culture without writing, the, the longest work you get is Homer, and you get one or two of them, right? Because everybody's got to remember it, and only the, the people who can remember it can only remember a couple works, and so you just get a couple works like that, right? The reason we have books, this is an intellectual technology, this is the extended mind, is so that we can ultimately know more than we can remember. And then you add to that, we can start with turning the page as opposed to scrolling. If you're scrolling, it's an undifferentiated stream. If you're turning the page, you at least have some sense where on the page was that idea, was that passage, was that dialogue that I'm interested in. And it turns out the human mind works that way. You, you're very good at locating things spatially. So knowing it was on the right page, the left page, the top half of the page, the bottom of the page actually helps you to remember the idea. And then if you write with a pencil, I'm sorry, if you read with a pencil or a pen in your hand, you underline, you notate that muscular memory, muscle memory reinforces the cognitive memory. Right, and, and, and so you're absolutely spot on about all of that. Thank you, those, those are good points, Mary. Flossie? Yes. I can I give you the last word for the day? Yes, I remember the McNeil Lehrer reports on KQED. There was time for Judy Woodruff to speak and other comfortable middle-aged women. And we listened carefully I didn't think we had to take notes. It was so clear. It was so easy. Now MSNBC, to which I have attached myself for several years, has become a nightmare for me because of all the yelling and screaming and the outrageously false commercials that follow. You can't take any kind of human tragedy seriously if it's followed by a commercial that wants to sell you another pharmaceutical, even if this age of pandemics. More than that, very sneakingly, I have noticed that the women who are now giving us the news, especially on NBC, are calling attention to themselves more than to the news the way they wear their hair, the way it's curled, the dresses that they change every day, the fingernails they're showing. What in the world does that mean except to sell you something that you don't want to buy? And that's what is making 
listening to the news and I mail. So thank you. Well, yeah, stop and, listening to MSNBC and go back to watching Judy Woodruff every day. She's on every day. You can she's watch any time of day, actually. To buy it is a pleasure. I wouldn't dream of listening to MSNBC and all those fingernails and everything. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. I and, and even better, read, read a book, right, which I know you do. But, but yes, I, I have to admit, I was having this conversation with my father yesterday as he turned on the news to see what was the most recent coming out of the January 6th report. I don't watch television news. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I probably spend a few hours a year watching television news, and I'm sure there's good stuff out there. But uh, it, it, the, the, the- So much the, more. The ratio of commercial crap, the the degree of packaging, and just you know the 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 temptation once that screen is on to to surf to another channel. I've decided that I'll get my news in in other forms. PBS is just as boring as ever, David. You should really go back to it. I'm sure, <laughs> world enough in time, I would, John. Once I'm retired. Um, thank you. Uh, wonderful to be in conversation with you guys today. Very best wishes for the holiday. Wishing you a, a warm, healthy, happy Christmas for those of you celebrating it. And, and I will see you next week to, to talk about the old year and the new year. Take thank care. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Take care.